the things, uh, the, the first class, one of the first things I teach people is that we get angry when our experience does not match our expectation. If we have certain things that we expect to happen and they don't happen, that's when we get angry. These people got angry. The, the, their experience did not match their expectations and they got angry. You see, about a year before this, Jesus was teaching a large crowd out in the country. And it was getting late and the people were getting hungry. And uh, Jesus said to his disciples, well, let's feed these people. And they said, you're crazy. We have no food. They took, you know, the story of the five, feeding the 5,000, which is the only story in the Bible that, that is in all four Gospels. Uh, we had our uh, trivia night this past week. And um, I got that one wrong. Rene got that one right. It was really good. Uh, uh, I didn't, it didn't occur to me at all. So uh, they were the, Jesus fed the 5,000 and, um, and then he's going to send them on their way. And the people at that moment said, uh, and I have it in your program there, John chapter 6. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, that's feeding the 5,000, they began to say, surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. This, this is a king. This is one who they, we've been waiting for for all these years. This is the guy. They, they had that sense. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, they were just going to, let's take him and make him king, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The crowd sensed that Jesus had the bearing of being a long-awaited king of Israel. The king that they had wanted for so long. The one that was going to be like David and restore the nation of Israel to where it was going to be. That's what they thought. And they wanted this earthly king. I mean, and really when you think about it, he would have been the perfect earthly king. He would have been the perfect person to be seated um, on the throne of David and lead the battle against the Romans. I, and he did everything that you could hope for in a leader. He was charismatic. He was decisive. He was powerful. He, people followed him. When he said things, he, the people kept on going, we've never heard anything like this before. This guy's amazing. And, and not only that, he was capable of feeding thousands of soldiers with very little food. <laughs> Think of the logistics. Not only that, healing the wounded, raising the dead. Here is a guy that there would be no army on earth that could come up against him. Really, when you think about it. He was that, he was, he was, they were going, my gosh, this is like, you know, God has sent this person to us to lead us to where we want, you know, to the promised land, you know, to the, where we're supposed to be. We can get rid of all this oppression. They wanted an earthly king. But when it became apparent that this wasn't the king that Jesus was going to be, they started calling for his blood. They wanted to crucify him. See, Jesus didn't have being an earthly king in mind. He had no intention whatsoever of establishing an earthly kingdom. In fact, he tells Pilate, he says, My kingdom does not consist of what you see around you. If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I'm not that kind of king. Not the world's kind of of King. In Luke, he says, the kingdom of God, this kingdom that I've come to show you, is not an earthly kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. Paul tells us in Romans 14, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus did come to set up a kingdom. The kingdom of God. In Matthew, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. It's the exact same thing. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And he, Jesus has come to, that's what he's come to, and that's a kingdom that he has come to rule over and to reign over. In fact, Colossians 1.13 tells us that the Father has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Everyone who 
uh, accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior is part of that kingdom. They are in that kingdom. The kingdom isn't and was never intended to be physical because earthly kingdoms are too limited to really accomplish the goals that Jesus had in mind. Earthly kingdoms have boundaries and borders and you can only go so far. You see, the kingdom of God doesn't have that. You can go anywhere you want to establish that kingdom. And so the people on this day that they were saying, uh, you know, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord, you know, glory to him that comes in the name of the Lord. This is our king laying down the palm branches and their coats and everything else. Um, start yelling, crucify him. Because they didn't get what they wanted. They misunderstood who Jesus was, what Jesus was about, what he was here for. And I think a lot of us still today have that same sort of problem. We approach Jesus for all sorts of reasons, but maybe not the reason that uh, Jesus has intended himself to be seen as. And so we, we have, and, and it's, it's in your program here too, there's this misunderstanding that remains. And there's four ways, four reasons, I think, that a lot of us approach Jesus today. And the first one, a lot of us approach Jesus um, to receive healing. We approach, we, I mean, we pray for healing. We want healing. We come and we say, um, you, know, uh, you know, God, uh, I'm not feeling well, can you make me better? They've heard that Jesus is pretty good at this healing thing. And so when a loved one gets sick or injured, they come to him. But they're not really interested in being healed spiritually. They just want to be healed, and that's it. <laughs> you know, take away this, this pain that I have. The second way that we come is sometimes we want him to be a, a problem solver. That's the next thing on the slide problem solver. We come and we say, God, I have all these problems. Jesus, I know that you can help me with this. You know, I have a problem with, um, you know, my marriage. I have a problem with uh, my kids. I have a problem with work. I have a problem with, um, uh, you know, finances. And I need these things solved. And so we come to him and we want him to solve all of our problems, but we don't we, we don't want to um, do anything else other than have him solve our problem. And so when our problems aren't solved, when we aren't healed, and we seem to think that our prayers aren't answered, the expectation isn't being met, and so what happens? We get mad at God. We get mad at Jesus. The other way, the third thing is this. Sometimes we come to him forgiveness. But not the forgiveness that we need to have a relationship with him. Sometimes we just come to him for forgiveness so we don't feel guilty. You know, um, you know it's like, uh, you know, forgive me of what I've done and then we feel better and, but we don't want to change. Uh, next time I do it, I'll just come back again and I'll ask for forgiveness. You know, and, and I can just keep on coming back and back and back again and not want to change how I actually go about living and and so we come to him that way the fourth way that we sometimes come to him is for inspiration but I'm, I, I, I think of it more of, of inspiration without the perspiration we come to him for the inspiration we want the good stories we want the heartwarming things we want him to say um, you know oh wasn't that great when Jesus did this you know um, we can learn from this uh, you know, 101 uh, leadership lessons from Jesus. And uh, yeah, I can be a better leader like Jesus. And, but we don't want any of the other stuff. We don't want anything. Uh, we don't want to be expected to, be, to do anything other than to follow a good example. And that's not what it can... I mean, Jesus can do all these things. But that's not why he came. He came to be our Savior and our Lord. He wants us to submit our lives to Him and to follow Him. And that's the Messiah that we are praising today.